Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build this Canadian armoured MG carrier from Copper State Models. This 35th scale plastic kit is the first from Copper State Models that I've built, and it certainly won't be the last. I did a what's in the box video for this kit a while ago, so if you'd like to see the sprues, and other bits and pieces that come in the box, feel free to check out that video. I won't be going over it here in this video. There's a link in the description below. Let's get right to gluing bits of plastic together. I start with this engine duba because the instructions say that's the starting point, and who am I to disagree? This isn't a full engine, but it will represent enough of an engine under the vehicle. Unless you turn it upside down, I guess. I glue this thing onto it here. I guess this is some sort of support, and it's easy enough to get into place. Then I add this drive shaft looking thing. It should have a downward angle to it. I follow that with this exhaust and muffler thing. This has a couple of pins that slot into the end of the engine bit, and it does require a little bit of kajiggering, but it sits in place well enough. I did my best to have the pipes with the muffler level with the engine bit, if that makes sense. Next, frames. And here you'll see me making mistakes already. Herbert making mistakes? Surely you jest? Ha <laughs> ha, no. I test fitted the jointy bit first, the correct way, and when I glued it together, for some reason I put it on upside down. That leaf spring looking thing should face downward, it's part of the rear suspension. I didn't realise the mistake right away, so I kept going. I put this middle bit on properly, and it wasn't difficult, but I probably should have put the engine part on first. You can see the drive shaft bit is sitting underneath the little raised curvy bit, and it should go over the top. I fixed that quite easily though. The rear leaf spring thingy was a bit more difficult to remove and reattach, but I got that done too. As best I can tell, the assembly is correct in this shot. Hopefully me making the mistakes will help prevent you from making them. Also, if you're building this yourself, I feel like you should pay a little bit of extra attention to getting the frame nice and straight. That should help with everything else down the track. Now, more leaf springs. You can see there's a sort of angled bit of keying here, kind of like a dovetail joint. This goes into place easily enough, though you may need to do a bit of nudging to make sure it's nice and straight. And here I'm fixing another mistake. I've clipped a part in half because I thought part of it was a sprue gate and not part of, well, the part. I did manage to glue it back together though, so I guess it's not that big a deal. That now not quite perfect part goes into place here, toward the front. There are notches in the frame that allow the positioning of this part. I follow that with this whatever it is. Looks to me like a piece of frame with some sort of shaft that goes to the engine. Again, try to get things nice and straight where you can. It will almost certainly affect a bunch of other stuff later on. The radiator fan then goes onto that shafty thing on the part we just installed. Simple enough. I do a bit of nudging to make sure it's straight, though in fairness, this will pretty much not be visible on the finished model. In front of that I put the radiator. Big surprise, I know. I don't know if I got this quite in the right spot, there was a bit of play to it, and it seems to have interfered with the cab floor a bit, but not too badly. It's kind of hard to know if that's going to happen or not at such an early point. But the part is on, and I guess that's the main thing. This little hose goes on next, and you probably won't be surprised to hear that tweezers make this a little bit less fiddly. And a knife, or anything you can use to kajigger the bits into place really. If your fingers are tiny enough to get in there, you could use those. Mine are not. The steering column comes next, and I'm sure the driver will appreciate this. Because this part connects with the radiator part, I think it's a little bit incorrectly placed, but it's on as best I could get it, and in the end it's not going to be super visible. Next, this part goes on the front here. There's a shaft that's meant to go into the radiator. There's a hole for it obviously, but this kind of makes the part have a tendency to tilt upwards. Again, almost definitely because of the placement of the radiator. It's not too bad in the end though. Now I add most of the rear stowage box. The bottom and back part, or is it the front? It goes toward the front of the vehicle, but I would consider it the back of the box. Anyway, this part goes into place easily. You might have to apply some pressure to minimise gaps, but it's nothing especially challenging. I then add the top of the box. This'll work a bit better if you hold the assembly upside down. 
That way the part will more or less just drop right into place and it is guided by the keying, which makes it very easy. Very nice. Very box. Time for the rear differential box. This consists of two parts which go together nice and easily. There is a bit of a gap there and I'm not sure if there should be or not, but it's not really going to be visible anyway so I don't bother doing anything about it. While that bonds, I deal with the front wheel holdy axley bit. I glue this thin and fairly delicate bar into place. Sure it probably has some sort of technical name, but that's not important. Yes it is! No it isn't really. This is a bit fiddly to get into place because there are only two small contact points for it to attach with, but it's not too bad. Just be careful with it. I set that aside to bond while I install the rear axle assembly. This is pretty simple to do. Just make sure that you get it around the right way so that you can put the drive shaft into the appropriate hole. I use plenty of glue to make sure that it stays right where I want it. I also did a bit of nudging to make sure it's as straight and neat as I can get it. Then I install the front axle with the delicate bar thing. If it weren't for that bar, this would be really simple to put into place, but you've got to be careful not to nudge that bar out of place, or worse, break it. Once that's where you want it, this steering bar, I guess you might call it, the one I accidentally cut off the main part, needs to join that linkage on the front left. It's not too difficult, but I do suspect it might be a little bit easier to do if you didn't previously mutilate the part. Now it's time for, well, not quite wheels. I guess these are brake assemblies, really. Or if you want to be technical, wheel holding doodads. You can see these are keyed, so they should go onto the ends of the axles nice and easily. Just make sure that you are using the correct part for either side. Otherwise you'll have trouble with the next step, which is, well, next. These fiddly rod things are part of the braking system, and there are two of them for either side. It makes sense to put the inner one on first, so that's what I've done. These aren't super fiddly to get into place, but they're not the easiest thing either. Medium fiddly, I guess. After a while we've got all four rods in place and I'm pretty happy with it, and these will be visible so it's not a bunch of fiddling for next to no visible result. The frame is looking fairly good and there's not really much else to do to it, so I begin working on the body. The first thing I did was to glue the pedals into place. There's a big blocky piece of keying on the underside of the floor part that pretty much determines where these pedals sit. They go on easily and they look fine, but they don't appear to have much room to move. Maybe that's how it should be, I wouldn't know. Then the back wall can go into place, well the back wall of the driving compartment anyway. This is easy to put on, though it doesn't look like it makes for a very comfortable driving area for the driver. The mount for the forward machine gun goes into place next. This simply drops into the two slots in the deck. You'll probably have to nudge it a bit so that it sits nice and vertical, but it's not at all tricky. Some internal framey wall thingies go into place next, and unsurprisingly, I've no idea what you might call these, but it certainly looks as though it would make moving around inside the fighting compartment just a little bit more difficult. These parts only needed a little bit of nudging to get them properly positioned, our old friend Pressure is as helpful as always here, and in short order we've got this. It's not complete of course, and we've still got a lot of stuff to add, like these bracing parts. They're very thin, and unless you want them to be all bent and wonky later on, I would suggest putting some effort into making sure these are as close to a 90 degree angle from the central bit as you can get them. Next, the rear machine gun mount goes into place. This is a little bit easier to get nice and vertical than the first one, thanks to there being three mounting points, though it does still need a bit of kajiggering. Also because there isn't really anything supporting the part that it's sitting on, pressing down too hard on this is not recommended. I then glue what I have of the body onto the frame, and this is where I noticed another minor issue, and I'm pretty sure it's entirely my fault, but the forward part just doesn't seem to want to sit all the way down on the frame. It does also look like the radiator is causing a bit of interference. I can't apply too much force to get things sitting where they should be, it's too delicate, but I did my best with it. It's obviously not perfect, but I figure these things look like they'd probably be pretty rickety and easily bent out of shape just by driving along. So I pushed ahead and didn't worry too much about it. This pair of levers goes onto the right side of the frame here, and this is made easy by the fairly solid mounting hole and pin. I then put the steering wheel into place. 
Again, I'm not totally sure this is at the right angle, but it's close enough. It should still function as a steering wheel and that's really what matters, isn't it? Now for the hull sides. Before we can attach them to the model, there's a couple of things that need to be added. On the right side we put this horn, or at least I'm assuming it's a horn. It looks like a horn. It looks like the kinds that would go Aruga. It also looks kind of annoyingly close for the driver. This is pretty simple to get into place, and once it's in position, that hull side can be installed. This wasn't too hard to do, though I figured it was a good idea to install it in sections. I glue it to the rear first, nudging the bracing parts into place as I went. Moving up to the front, I had to do a bit more pressure applicating and nudging to get things to line up as neatly as I could, and it's certainly not perfect, but I think it's workable and hopefully the little errors aren't noticeable once everything's all together. The left side, obviously, comes next. And again, there's stuff that needs to be glued onto the inside. This time, a tank. The end parts go onto this and that's fairly simple, though you definitely want to be careful of the very fine hose and tap this thing has. On the inside of the left hull side, I glue this box. I have no idea what its function is, but it goes into place nice and easily here. This is followed by the tank with its hose. I'm assuming this is the fuel tank for the main engine. Were I the driver of this thing, I don't think I would really want that to be right next to me, but then I wouldn't really want to be in this thing in the first place, especially if it was getting shot at. Still, it's a really nice piece of detail. It makes sense to then install that hull side, obviously on the left side of the vehicle because there's already a hull side on the right. And this one goes on pretty much the same way as the right one did. Again, not perfect, but I did my best, and it should, I hope, line up nicely with the front plate when it's time for that to go on. But before I do that, I put the rear on, because why not? I figured it made sense to attach this to the stowage box first, and it fit well. Then I went about attaching it to the fighting compartment bit, and I was a little bit stumped at first. I didn't think it was fitting quite right. There is a gap down the sides and at the back and it didn't quite line up, though the rest of the parts do seem to be in the proper place. Maybe it's meant to be that way, or maybe it's not. At any rate, the vehicle's rear plates are in place. At this point I was looking in the driver's area and figured it would probably look a bit better if the pipe coming out of that tank wasn't just hanging there going nowhere. So I added some glue and pressed it against the hull side where there's a moulded on bit of pipe. This probably would have been a bit easier to do before installing the hull side, but hey, better late than never. Back to the rear, I install this pair of grab handles. These are some thin, somewhat delicate pieces, but they're not especially difficult to place. Then, some little handles. I guess these are for opening the rear flappy bit. The instructions suggest leaving these off until later if you're doing particular markings. I've decided that I just won't paint my MG carrier in that scheme, which allows me to glue them into place and not lose them. Next, I install the front plate. This isn't too difficult, though I did have to apply a bit of pressure in some places to get everything to line up neatly. To decorate that front plate we need some lamps. I don't think those are decorative, Herbert! There are two side lamps, and they've got a mounting moulded into them for both sides, so we're going to need to clip one of those off of each lamp and they need to be the opposite of each other, otherwise you will only be able to mount one of them, and that may be a problem. Before adding these lamps to the vehicle, there's a little rim thing, I guess you might call it, and it should be centred over the opening in the front. There's no keying for this, so you'll have to manually centre it over the opening in the front of the lamp. There is also a clear lens that should go in here, but obviously I'm leaving that off until after painting. Same with this bigger lamp. This has a little hatch thingy in the back, I guess for lighting it, which has a handle and that's glued into the back of it, but I forgot to film myself doing this, so this is what it looks like. Instead of installing those lamps, I attach the lower front plate. This could be modelled up or down. I assume this was folded up when driving around to get airflow over the radiator, and down when there was shooting happening. I follow this with a little flap thing that hangs down just behind the rear axle. I guess this is to protect the stowage box? It's possibly even easier than it looks to put this in place. Back to the front plate, where I installed a big headlamp. I think this looks cool, kind of like the headlamp on a steam locomotive. It's pretty easy to install, and only a little bit of nudging was required. 
The smaller side lamps can go on after this, and you can see that I've managed to cut the correct parts, which is probably surprising. There's a notch on either side for these to go into, just make sure that you mount the lamps so that they're facing in a somewhat forward direction, not up or down or any weird angles. Next, to make it easier for the crews to get into the vehicle, we've got these little stirrup things. These were a bit fiddly to get into place, and they're slightly thin and delicate, so you can't apply too much pressure to them, but I did eventually get them on. There's one of these for either side. A component I think is really important for things like mobility are wheels. The front and rear wheels are different, not that different, but you can tell them apart. And there are axles for each wheel to mount onto. Thanks Captain Obvious! A small amount of nudging was needed to make sure that they were all nice and straight, and once they're on, it really helps to make the MG carrier look that much more complete. It isn't, but it is getting close. Now it's time to add the machine guns. Kind of important for a machine gun carrier, I would assume. First, there are some little arm things. I don't know what you would call these. They're mounts that go onto the mounts for the gun. I glued mine into place, but you could also leave them unglued. At least until you figure out where you want the gun to sit. These guns are water-cooled, and I don't know much about guns, water-cooled or not, but these ones have little tins for the condenser water. These have a handle that you need to glue into the top of them, which is quite simple. Maybe a little bit fiddly, but not too difficult. I follow that by assembling the ammo boxes. These are comprised of three parts. The two sides of the box go together nice and easily, and on top of that, the bit with the ammo. This doesn't look too bad from a distance, but there is a bit of flashing on the bullet tips, which I don't feel like I could clean up nicely without accidentally breaking some of the bullet tips off, which would be a bit more annoying than having the flash. If you've got a nice steady hand, which I quite often don't, you could remove this flashing and it would look a lot better. The gun itself comes as a single piece, which is nice. It barely even needed any cleanup. I give that a hearty thumbs up. The ammo box gets glued into place on the right side of the gun. Then the handily triggery thing goes on the rear of the gun. Simple enough. This thing, I don't actually know what it is. Yeah, big surprise there! It looks like some sort of strap. Maybe the end of the ammo belt? It's straight, but the instructions show that it curves downwards. So I bent it so there would be a curve in the part. It's not really a neat bend, but it works well enough. At the front of the gun, we add this condenser hose. I suggest leaving this to bond for a bit before trying to install the gun. The hose is longer than it needs to be to allow some flexibility in its positioning. I glue the condensation can onto the hull floor, and this is where the instructions show the front one, but I suspect it could be moved around to wherever was suitable. I mean, they wouldn't bolt that into the floor, would they? At any rate, I've put it where the instructions show. I don't want the instruction police to show up at my door. It seems like the logical thing to do next would be to install the gun. So I do that, trimming the condenser hose until it fits. It's best to cut off little bits at a time until you get the right length, than to cut off too much in one go. I'm only showing the installation of one gun, which is pretty easy really, though I didn't do too much bending on the hose for this one. You can bend the hose a little bit, but it is still plastic and will break if you're not careful. And with that, the Copper State Models Canadian Armoured MG Carrier, in 35th scale, is now completed. And you can see that I have done a little bit of extra bending on the hose for the rear machine gun. I'm pretty pleased with how this model has turned out. Sure it's not perfect, and I obviously made a few mistakes, but would it really be a Herbert Erpaderp video if there were no mistakes? Yeah, probably, but it'd be a rare one. Hopefully those mistakes can help somebody. Even with the various errors, I think the result is quite good. It's a really odd looking and very interesting vehicle. I do enjoy the more odd looking World War I stuff. I mean, the most common stuff like the tanks and things we always see are also cool, but the other bits of equipment that you don't see very often are also very interesting. I guess a lot of armour and mechanical stuff was new at that time, so there was a lot of experimenting and weird designs. Sure, with hindsight you can say they were bad designs, but people didn't know then and they were experimenting. And fortunately for us modellers, where kits are available, we get some really fun kits to build out of it. Maybe I'm starting to waffle. Anyway, the point is I really like this. I think it's interesting. Not only does it look good, but I rather enjoyed the build. For the most part anyway. 
some of the more fiddly bits were kind of frustrating, and I didn't enjoy the major mistakes I made, but overall the process was enjoyable. Not the easiest kit I've put together, but I wouldn't say that it was the hardest either, and it wouldn't be an ideal kit for a beginner modeler, but somebody with a bit of experience might enjoy the challenge it poses. I couldn't tell you how accurate the detailing in this kit is, I'm obviously no MG carrier surgeon, but it looks convincing enough compared to photos of the real thing, so I'd say it's reasonably accurate. I will say that I kind of wish they'd included some extra ammo boxes or something. I would imagine a vehicle like this would carry a reasonable amount of ammo. Oh well, what I can tell you is that the parts in this kit are quite neat, and I didn't find myself having to do too much cleanup. Obviously there are mould lines that will need to be removed, but nothing out of the ordinary. Also the detail is nice and crisp. All of those things contribute to the pleasure of building a kit like this, and I'm quite excited to start building another kit from Copper State Models, and unless something unfortunate happens after I've done this voiceover, there will be a what's in the box video about my next Copper State Models kit, so keep an eye out for that. If I remember I'll add a link. Okay, so I don't have a whole lot else to say about this, certainly nothing that you can't see with your own eyes, but if you're building your own MG carrier, it's definitely worth being careful and taking your time to get everything together nice and neatly and the right way around. You should now be equipped with enough knowledge to avoid the mistakes I made, and I hope you have fun with it. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comment section below. If you'd like to watch me build kits like this one live on stream, head on over to my Twitch channel, which is where I happen to stream. The link is in the description below. And if you've not already done so, why not subscribe here on YouTube for the low low price of absolutely nothing. Or if you have the means and you want to help a Herbert Erpaderp do Herbert Erpaderp things, and see my videos a bit early, consider becoming a patron. I'd really appreciate that. You can find links to Patreon and all of my other things like Discord and social media in the description below. And as always, I shall return soon. So until then, be excellent to each other, have a wonderful day, and thanks for watching. Farewell.